Hi there, Dr. Leo Ho Nam here from the Rofi Clinic. We have another session to learn something about COVID vaccines where we try to make science simple and relevant for everyone. Today we'll talk about the bivalent COVID vaccine. Which one is better for me? I'm going to answer a second question as well as, do I really need a bivalent COVID vaccine? If you want to know more details about the bivalent COVID vaccine, we have an earlier YouTube where we went into in-depth discussion about the bivalent COVID vaccine. But today's question is, which one is better for me? And I hope to address the question, should I or should I not? Do I really need the bivalent COVID vaccine? The context currently is that complete vaccination completes, consists of three doses, two mRNAs as well as one booster vaccine. There are new threats now all around the world. In Singapore, we have the XBB and this has been found in other countries as well, from South Asia to Europe to the Americas and of course in other parts of Asia, Asia Pacific such as Japan. In USA, the reports of BQ1 and the progeny BQ11 has been spreading a lot faster than the BA5 strains. We have many individuals now who have had reinfections, and sometimes it can be just as bad. We have yet long COVID. Honestly, it's been a long time. We have so few clues on long COVID. Can we find out more? Can we learn more? This is the US data on COVID variants taken towards the end of October. As you can see, the green bars right at the bottom, that's the BA5, the numbers are shrinking, but there's one up and coming variant that's coming up very fast, that's the BQ1. And of course, the BQ1, there is a BQ11. I'm going to show you the colors here now. The rising star is the BQ1, and as well as the next rising star is BQ11. These will be the variants that's going to take over not just USA, but other parts of the world. This is Singapore's data. As you can see, over from September to October, there's a sharp increase in cases, and that is fueled by XBB. Thankfully, the numbers have started coming down. We see a fast rise and a fairly fast descent as well. This is prediction. And I think future variants will be very similar, sharp rise and sharp fall thereafter. Again, just a reminder, it's called XBB because the combination of two variants, BA2.75 as well as BA2. The two questions I'm going to deal with in this YouTube video is actually this one. Which bivalent is better? Is it a Moderna bivalent or should I get the Pfizer bivalent? Is there a difference? And on the next question is, do I really need the bivalent vaccine? I hear you, everyone's getting tired of getting the vaccines, but do we really need it? We have the Pfizer BioNTech bivalent vaccine. Bivalent because there are two valents. It consists of the ancestral strain as well as the BA4 and BA5. Moderna bivalent, on the other hand, is the ancestral strain plus BA1. You notice there's a change. You see how the BA4 and 5 is BA1. But if you were to go to the United States and ask for bivalent vaccine and it is Moderna, they're going to give you the ancestral strain plus the BA4 and 5. So mind you, there's a slight difference between the Moderna which you get from Singapore as well as the Moderna which you get from the States. Very importantly, we like the bivalent because it promises breath and spread of the immunity. You have a wider breath, then hopefully you can deal with the variants of the future. You can certainly watch my other YouTube in the past explaining the value of that. There's no specific advantage between Pfizer and Bio as well as Moderna in, in treating the variants XBB or BQ1 or BQ1.1. They are, in essence, they should be treated the same. What are the side effects of the vaccines? 
Well, it is very comparable to the original primary vaccination course. If you have Pfizer in the past, there is going to be a very similar reaction if you take the Pfizer bi bivalent vaccine or the same for that of the Moderna bivalent vaccine. But immediately, you can notice on this slide, it tells you that the Pfizer has much, much fewer mRNA. In the case of Moderna, you have much more, about 50 micrograms. Now, in comparison, Moderna in the primary vaccination course has 100 micrograms, now it's been half to 50 micrograms. So in essence, you're talking about 30 micrograms comparison versus Moderna, 50 micrograms comparison. And I can tell you the reactions between the booster with a bivalent is still very similar to the primary vaccination series. To help us understand what is the difference between Pfizer and Moderna, uh, bivalent booster vaccines, let's go back and look at the primary vaccination sequence comparison between Pfizer and Moderna. This is the study we'll be looking at. Now, I want you to look at the right side of the table under the dose two section. You'll notice there's a Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna. We're going to try to compare across the two. If you look at the two columns of numbers, you do a quick eyeball, you'll notice that the reactions are a little bit more with Moderna. Certainly, many patients have come back to tell me and they, they, they have a bit more reactions on Moderna. Again, that's not surprising because they have a lot more vaccines. Remember, previously it was 30 micrograms versus 100 micrograms. So Moderna does have a slightly higher reaction rate after vaccination and mind you this is all vaccination schedule and this uh, they use 100 micrograms. We do know however that Moderna has a stronger immune response. If you look at the antibodies response it tends to peak a little bit higher and it lasts longer and in fact studies have also shown if you do a mix between Pfizer and Moderna or as well as Pfizer versus Pfizer and Pfizer the Pfizer Moderna will end up with a larger amount of antibodies. So I guess um, you do you get you get what you pay for. If you have more mRNA that's given inside, you're going to have a little bit more of an immune response. Everyone gets very worried about myocarditis after mRNA vaccines. I want to stress to everyone again that the myocarditis risk after natural COVID infection is really quite high. We're talking about 0.15% or about 150 cases per 100,000 uh, COVID individuals, infected individuals there are. And this is for natural COVID infection. My reference for the 150 cases per 100,000 comes from this reference, which is the MMWR that is published uh, by CDC. In comparison, you only have about nine cases per 100,000 patients without COVID-19. So the risk is really, really much higher for the natural infections. But how can I compare it against the vaccinations? Well, the vaccination risk is about one to two per 100,000. And this comes from a Lancet paper, which I've attached. Again, you can immediately see 150 cases versus one to two per 100,000. This is the same data again presented side by side, 150 cases in natural infection versus 1.2 in the vaccines. If you actually look at the uh, risks, it's about infection versus vaccines is about 100 times more. And between Pfizer and Moderna, you notice there's a slight difference. Uh, Moderna with a slightly higher risk of, of getting myocarditis compared to Pfizer. That's understood because it comes with a higher dose of mRNA. And I want to quote something from the paper and it says this, the risk was highest in men aged 18 to 25, one to seven days after receipt of the second dose. So the young people are greater at risk and uh, what they're talking about 18 to 25 in this paper. I'll give you another age range in another paper. So we know that of the first and second dose, what about the booster dose? Are the numbers the same for the booster dose? And why are we talking about the same risk? To appreciate the myocarditis risk after the booster dose, we would look at this paper from the Annals of Internal Medicine, looking at the myocarditis 
uh, as well as pericarditis risk after mRNA vaccination uh, booster dose. So this is the table where you see those one, those two, as well as the third column, first booster. We're going to look at the numbers uh, with the first booster on the rightmost down there. You'll see immediately the numbers go up as you go from the first dose, the second dose, and the first booster. And the numbers are really particularly much higher at about 12 to 29 years old. Then if you actually do a comparison between the males and the females, which is blue and red, you notice that the males' risks are much, much higher than the females' risk. So the post-booster vaccines, well, uh, the 12 to 15 years old, there is some risk, but the greatest risk is actually in the 16 to 70 years old, and you see it at 188 per, uh, per million doses are given. Consistently, we get the same messaging, the males outnumbers that of females by about four to five times. Same table again, and um, this time round we're going to do a Pfizer and Moderna comparison. We'll look all the way at the first booster effect. The first booster here, we're going to look at the 18 to 29 for the males and females for the Pfizer's versus 18 to 29 for the Moderna's. And you can see that there's a slight difference between the two but this is honestly not very significant between Pfizer and Moderna in causing myocarditis. So what does this say for post-booster vaccine myocarditis? Pfizer and Moderna are actually comparable in risk. I'm going to summarize this data here for everyone again. Post-booster vaccine myocarditis, the risk starts going out at about 12 to 12 years old. The risk goes up much higher at 16 to 17 years old, with the males outnumbering the males outnumbering the females by about four to five times. And the small print which you are watching the video for is that the Moderna numbers are slightly higher compared to the Pfizer numbers, but I don't think it's significantly bigger. At this point in time, I just want to stress to you: the vaccine no doubt causes myocarditis but it's about 100-fold less than that of natural infections. So taking the vaccine does have its advantage. So if I were to take the next booster dose uh, from uh, ancestral strain monovalent to a bivalent vaccine, what would I expect? I would expect a slight increase in myocarditis risk. And we know that the risk is higher between males versus females, and the risk is highest at about 12 to 30 years old. When you're more than 40 years old, that risk is really not a lot more. Uh, to minimize the risk further, because I know that the 12 to 30 years old are the ones at risk, I would rather use the Pfizer vaccines for those who are 12 to 30 years old, simply to lower that little bit more of the risk. So the next question I'm going to deal with is, do I really need the booster bivalent dose? And to answer the question, I'm going to pose you back this question. And the question is, can you afford to fall sick? If you can afford to fall sick, maybe you don't need the bivalent dose. So who are the different people? When can I afford to fall sick? Okay, if you are very young and healthy, it's honestly most people, 99.99% of them will go through it. It's a breeze, no issues at all. You may even end up with a little bit of pneumonia in about less than 1% of the people, but you'll be fine. There's a 0.01% risk of something called MISC, but honestly, that risk is low at 0.01%. But of course, uh, my viewers are going to tell me if it happens to you or your family, number statistics don't, don't matter. If you're the unfortunate individual, the whole world seems to just collapse and fall around you. If you are elderly immunocompromised, on the other hand, or you have other medical conditions, then the risk is that you should take the vaccine because it's going to be suffering. There are studies to show that each subsequent infection, the risk of uh, comorbidities, the risk of repeated infections, uh, the risk of being sick, it is not lower. So for those which are elderly, immunocompromised with medical conditions, I would strongly urge you to think about getting vaccinated with the bivalent vaccine. That will help you tremendously. Now, but there is a wild card in all this. The wild card is long COVID. Who will get long COVID? 
The trouble is we don't even know how well to define long COVID. We have our usual definitions three months after the COVID infection for symptoms that seems keeps persisting, especially that of brain fog. So the wild card is that someone young, someone healthy who is not expected to do badly for COVID-19 may end up with long COVID. And if you have seen patients with long COVID, or at least read the description of it, you realize it's not something simple, it's not something to trifle with. You will you will feel very tired, you feel very lousy, you 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 can't go on with your life as if your whole life just stagnated in front of you. So I drew a couple of dice, actually four dice here, four die here just to just to illustrate the randomness of it. We don't know who will land, get, end up with long COVID and who, who won't. If we can do that prediction, then we can say, well, perhaps you won't have long COVID, perhaps you don't need the uh, booster vaccine bivalent. Problem with reinfections is every time you get the next infection with COVID, you risk getting long COVID. So the more reinfections you get, the higher the risk of you getting long COVID. And this is what the studies are showing. And then if you already have long COVID and now you get reinfection, it's going to worsen your long COVID symptoms. Vaccination does help with long COVID, but not all the time, 50% of the time. And then when you do have long COVID and you go vaccination, 17%, 17% will get it worse. Now the problem with long COVID is this, we know so little about it, we have no treatment for it, and honestly, it is really a miserable condition to have. And I think Professor Akiko Iwasaki's, Iwasaki said it very, very correctly, long COVID is a parallel pandemic that most people aren't really thinking of. But if you've seen the long COVID patients, which I have seen, you really don't wish it on your worst enemy. I'm going to put it graphically another way. Uh, we are looking at COVID cases that are falling in numbers, people are opening up and people are not so bothered about it. People are not bothered with COVID vaccinations anymore. But what we have happening on the other hand is that long COVID is, uh, is accumulating. As more people fall sick, you're going to land, land long up with long COVID. It is a parallel pandemic. We kind of forgot. One virus that causes two problems, acute infection as well as long COVID. Coming back to the question, do I really need the booster bivalent dose? I'm going to break it up into the few groups which I think you would benefit from COVID uh, bivalent booster dose. If you're elderly, you have immunocompromised host, you have medical conditions such as heart problems, kidney issues, liver issues, stroke issues, I would really, really encourage you to take the bivalent vaccine because you really want to minimize the risk of getting COVID again. When you get COVID again, studies have indicated your bad chronic medical conditions will predispose you to another round of bad illness. And individuals with heart problems and the elderly, it really isn't pleasant getting COVID again. Are you an essential worker? For myself as a physician, as a doctor, I need to be present at the hospital. I need to be around to see my patients. If I can't work, I'm taking a much needed uh, person out of the system. We are really short of healthcare workers as it is. Every worker on the ground is important. So if you are an essential worker, please take the bivalent vaccine. Now, next thing is a very practical uh, social reason. You have an important event coming up. I'm going to travel towards the end of the year. I'm going to get myself a bivalent vaccine so that I'm going to have my trip and I'm not going to f worry so much about having a bad illness from it. So if you have an important event coming up, take the bivalent so that you are really quite sure you're going to won't fall too badly ill from it. If you have a family member at risk, you live with someone else with existing heart cardiac problems, heart problems, and the person cannot afford to fall sick, then you want to try to cocoon up the individual and you would want to vaccinate yourself so you don't bring back the risk of COVID to the individual. So for that, uh, take the bivalent vaccine. Now, the next question I'm going to put for is, are you worried about long COVID? If you're worried about long COVID, 
then it will be worthwhile taking the bivalent vaccine. If you can reduce down the infection and certainly the severity of illness, I think we can lower down the risk of long COVID as well. So at the end of the day, who doesn't need the booster dose? Well, at your own risk. If you are quite sure that you you want to take the risk of long COVID, or you think you're going, or you're going to fall on the right side of things, uh, and you're not worried about long COVID, then you don't really need the booster bivalent dose, especially if you have completed your three doses of the mRNA vaccines. This is pretty much the summary slide which I want to share with you. Bivalent COVID vaccine will benefit most people. Most people will get help from it. Uh, you will reduce down the risk of severe illness and in turn, when you prevent yourself falling sick, you can actually reduce down the risk of long COVID. The problem is long COVID is unknown risk. Who will get it? Who wouldn't fall, get it? And Professor Akiko uh, said it very correctly. Long COVID is a parallel pandemic. Same condition, same virus causing two conditions, the acute infection as well as the long COVID. If you get long COVID because of um, COVID infection, it's just, it's just terrible. You have absolutely no energy. You can't get on with your life. And your whole life is if, as if it just stops in front of you. There is, there are, some complications of COVID vaccines, vaccinations, the mRNA, or any other vaccines. In the case of bivalent COVID vaccine, we would expect myocarditis as well. And um, the risk is small. It is about 100 times less of the COVID infections. But nonetheless, there's still a small risk of myocarditis, especially for those which are aged 12 to 30. So the final question, should you take or not take the vaccine, comes down to this question. Can you afford to fall sick? Or rather, can you afford not to take the vaccine? You will take the vaccine for your own self because of illnesses. You want to take it for work because you're an essential worker or because you have an important event which you have to attend. Or maybe it's for other family members you want to protect. Or perhaps again, it's back to your own self. You want to prevent yourself from getting long COVID. Now, unfortunately, I can't give you a simple answer to that. The risk of long COVID is the biggest unknown. I look well now, but the next time I get COVID, I may end up with long COVID. That's something I wouldn't wish even for my worst enemy. There you have it. This comes to the end of the talk. Do you have any follow-up questions? Let us know. Leave us your comment. We would really love to hear from you. And remember, click subscribe and follow this channel as a teaser. I'm going to look at the bivalent COVID vaccine. How effective will it be in protecting the XBB and the QB11? Will we still get infected? Chances are yes. How bad will it be? Well, you have to watch the YouTube to find out.